Alrighty, um, so I'm going to go ahead and start. I just have to double check everything is in order. Um, so I recorded the lesson, the entire lecture, and realized that the audio didn't work. And then I did it again. And I realized that the audio. Sorry, I realized that the audio still didn't work the second time either. Um, to say that I am very bummed out that this is the third time I record a uh, one hour lecture um, is an understatement. So um, again, I mean, as you can see here, I. I'm through everything. But I guess I got to do it again. Um, but I don't have any more copies of the packet of the story, so I'm going to actually use an actual page of the book, which I feel super, super bad about because I don't want to write on the book, but I have no options. OK, so I'm going to ignore that this is the actual book that I am writing on. Okay. All right, so I hope everybody's doing well. Um, if you did not get a chance to get your packet, please get your packet. I'm going to repeat because I'm assuming some people are not listening, but please do not write on the book. I am writing on the book because this is the third time I record this lesson um, and I do not have any more pack packets. So do not uh, write on the book. I'm going to repeat that. Do not write on the book. Only I am writing on the book. You write in your packet. Do not write on the book. You write in your packet. OK, all right, here we go. Uh, so first things first, um, we have this text here. I'm going to try to use as many posts as it's possible. I guess it's not very helpful because I'm still writing. Um, but this is a 2015 text. Uh, written by uh, Matt de la Peña. Okay, and so here we have 2015 Matt de la Peña. All right, and so he is the author, Matt de la Peña is the author, and the illustrator is Christian Robinson. And so he's the one that uh, put these pieces together as far as uh, the the illustrations, right? Um, we have these images that, you know, are very colorful. Um, they're primitive. And they um, represent a diverse group of people, a diverse uh, city more than anything. Um, now, looking at the at the shape of the street that we have here, I'm going to infer that uh, this is probably somewhere in uh, San Francisco. So I'll make note of that here. Maybe it's San Francisco um, because of uh, these steep roads that are very common in San Francisco. Uh, but whether it's in San Francisco or um, wherever it is, for sure we know um, that it depicts the urban life uh, that you see in most inner cities. Um, now, we do have here um, the story of CJ, right? So CJ is the character that we have here, all right? And so CJ is right here. And so he is the main character of the story, and we have Nana, who is seen right here. Now, Nana is a great uh, character for the story. She serves as kind of the wise uh, woman. Uh, she would be the archetype of, you know, the wise man, quote unquote, um, that you would usually get in stories. That's the kind of person that Nana um, displays in this particular story. Um, we do have here uh, a text that won the Newberry uh, Medal which is a huge honor because the Newberry Medal is not usually given to picture books. Only two times ever has the Newberry Medal been given 
to a picture book and only one time has this medal ever been awarded to a Latino author and it was awarded to Matt de la Peña. So I am excited to see that, you know, um, what Matt put together, his messages and, you know, just him being a Latino author and representing our Latino community is, is a great honor, right, to have him win such a prestigious award. Um, and so let's go ahead and read this page, right? We have page one here. Uh, the text says here in the bottom, CJ pushed through the church doors, skipped down the steps. The outside air smelled like freedom, but it also smelled like rain, which freckled CJ's shirt and dripped down his nose. So first and foremost, actually, give me one second, I'm sorry. Let's see what I can fix. Sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. We're getting somewhere. Did we go somewhere? All righty. Um, so yeah, we got somewhere. It so looks a little bit better. All right, perfect. So it says here, CJ pushed through the church door. So we have CJ here. Um, CJ, I'll tell you right off the bat, he is going to be a major character um, in this story. Um, we do see here um, a setting, right? We see specifically that they are going through the church doors. So um, for setting here, okay. And you can go ahead and might make your notes in the white area of your packet. Um, for setting, we have church doors. We can infer um, that this is a Sunday. Um, we can infer that this is around the daytime. Um, and like we said, um, this is a, a city, right? It feels like it's um, a city in particular. We don't know exactly where, but you know, we we can make that inference. Um, we do see that CJ skipped down the steps, um, which shows us a young boy um, who is playful. Um, he's not like Charles that is shy or scared. Um, this is a boy who who is playful and and he demonstrates that demeanor right as he uh, skips down the stairs of the church. Um, again, he is playful. We can infer that um, he's excited in some way. Um, and so we see him and Nana here and they both look um, happy, right? They they don't look um, upset. You know, they both have, you know, a smile on their face. So they look happy. Um, he, I mean, they look fine, both of them, right? They, they look okay for the most part. Um, and then when we see here in this other image, we see here that it says the outside air smelled like freedom, but it also smelled like rain. Um, now we do have these two words like here, um, which represent that what we have uh, here is a simile. Specifically, we have the word air 
being compared to freedom. And we have the word air again in the next line, but now we're talking about the smell of air that is being compared uh, to the smell of rain. Um, now this particular word choice, um, and I'm gonna put here WC um, freedom is interesting um, for CJ to use. Um, we can infer that um, he likes being outside because he's talking about the air outside smelling like freedom. So we can put here, um, he may uh, like going outside. Again, because of that comparison to feeling like he is free, maybe he doesn't like going to church. Maybe he's kind of like forced to go. Um, we're not entirely sure, but that word choice is interesting, right? Um, that he smells um, freedom. Right now, we do have literally the word smell repeated two times here, um, which is an example of olfactory imagery. OK, and we also have that third line that says that the rain freckled CJ's shirt and dripped down um, his nose. All right. And so we do have the rain here um, and then we do have the air here. Um, and so these, as well as the dripping down his nose, the rain dripping on his nose, because it's touching his nose, this is an example of tactile imagery. And so we can see here that CJ is an observant boy. Okay. Um, we can see that he observes his surroundings. Um, he's looking at um everything that surrounds him you'll see it more right as we continue to read that he's a boy who is definitely paying attention all right we move on to the next page now the next page says he ducked under his nana's umbrella saying how come we gotta wait for the bus and all this wet trees get thirsty too his nana told him don't you see that big one drinking through a straw CJ looked for a long time, but never saw a straw. So right here we have uh, an example of what we call dialogue, um, which is a conversation between two or more people. Um, and you usually see dialogue in plays, right? And we can see it here in this conversation between Nana and CJ. Now CJ um, does use um, A dialect here. And I love the way that Matt de la Peña uses um, CJ's dialect to kind of represent the different types of languages that still exist in a lot of different regions in the United States. Um, we're, we don't have just one particular language or way of speaking. Uh, we are made up of different languages that come together to, perf to, to form these dialects that you can hear in different places around um, the US. And so we can see that from CJ here when he's questioning why they gotta wait for the bus when it's basically um, raining, right? And so, CJ already begins to question what he feels would be something that is unfair. Like, why do we have to wait? Um, and so you feel that unfair sentiment on his part. And he's basically saying, like, why do we wait um, if it's raining? Like, isn't there a plan B? Right. And I love the way that Nana responds. And she says, trees get thirsty, too. And so here, um, even though we do know that trees um, do require a lot of water, uh, we can see that the way that she says it would be an example of uh, personification, where she basically turns the flower, sorry, the tree into a human um, that needs um, to drink water because it is thirsty, right? And so this emotion of thirst is what would make this an example of personification. Now, CJ's question in particular is an example of indirect characterization. Um, it characterizes him as a boy who is curious about his surroundings um, and open-minded in the sense that he's eager and he's willing to learn. Um, he just doesn't know too much about things or why things are uh, what they are, but definitely a curious boy who who is willing to to learn and 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 eager, right, to get his questions answered. Now, 
I love the way that um, Nana kind of shifts this, right? She makes it seem like, hey, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Yeah. That we have to wait um, only because, you know, the 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 rain um, is needed for the trees. So she kind of turns something negative into something positive, right? She acknowledges, she doesn't like really acknowledge like, hey, yes, it's unfair that we're waiting for the bus when it's raining. Like she doesn't necessarily do that. Um, instead, what she does is that she will shift it to say like, you know, yes, we are the ones that are waiting in the rain, but other people, right, need and especially the trees in this case, which is what she says, they need that water, right? So, all right here, uh, Nana explains why rain isn't a bad thing, but I love the way, like I said, she does it in a selfless way. Um, I think she is very selfless in her response by, you know, kind of shifting that 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 focus that, you know, even though they would benefit from not having to wait in the rain, there are other things that this world uh, needs and, you know, people and, and, and the trees and the plants and, you know, they have their needs and those needs also need to be uh, met. Makes sense. And you can see here in, in the image of both Nana and uh, CJ, again, uh, they look happy. Um, they look, I would even say in a way peaceful, considering that they are standing outside um, in the rain. Okay. And like I said, I love the way that uh, Nana turns their negative situation into something That is okay because others' um, needs are being met through the rain, right? And so she's basically uh, acknowledging that. You know, there are other people who have other needs. In this case, the trees, they're thirsty and they want rain too. And so we shouldn't complain because um, we need to also be protective of nature. We need to also protect our surroundings. And we need to acknowledge that other people have their needs um, to be met as well. And I'll show you the post-it that I had written. One of my original lectures, right? And so there we have those three points uh, that Nana basically makes in her response to uh, CJ's question. And I'll give you a few seconds to write that down. And if you don't have a postage, just go ahead and pause the recording, go get your postage, you know where to find them, and then go ahead and write down those three points. Moving on to the next page. Now in this next page in particular, um, if we see here, uh, we do see that they are already at the bus stop um, and the text reads, from the bus stop, he watched water pool. From the bus stop, he watched water pool on flower petals, watched rain patter against the windshield of a nearby car. His friend Colby climbed in gave CJ a wave, and drove off with his dad. Nana, how come we don't got a car? And so we see here a few things. Number one, we see that they are at a bus stop. Okay, so we see the, the sign here. Um, we do see here um, CJ, and I'll show you the image that I wrote down. If you want to write down these, copy down these annotations. Um, but we do see here, right, um, CJ, right, basically waving at his friend um, Colby, right? We see uh, right off the bat that it's still raining, okay? 
Uh, and then here you see Colby basically waving back at CJ, but the difference between uh, Colby and CJ is that Colby is in a vehicle and CJ is, as you can see here, um, he is in the bus stop area. Now in this bus stop area, you also see a young lady here and by the looks of it, right, we see that she is on her phone. And then we also see, um, I don't know if he's an elderly man, but he seems a little bit older. Um, and we see that he's reading a newspaper. Okay. And so when we look at the actual text here, um, we see that he watched the water pool on flower petals. And this right here is an example of indirect characterization of uh, CJ. He continues to come off as a boy who is observant of his surroundings. It's a good thing, right, that he is um, in a way noticing everything, right? Um, now he watched the rain patter against the windshield, right? And I, that rain patter, right, I can almost hear it. Um, and so I would call this auditory imagery because I can hear that rain pattering in this description. And we also see here that it says um, that, you know, you have that universal wave between uh, CJ and Colby, and then you have that question, right? Now, Colby is uh, what we would call a minor character. He doesn't have a major role in the story. OK, and we don't know too much about um, Colby, so that would make him also a flat character and he doesn't necessarily change throughout the story. So he would also be a static character. Again, we don't know much about him and he doesn't change throughout the story, um, but Colby basically is his friend and he does have a car and this prompts uh, CJ to ask Nana why they don't have a car. And we get again that notion of curiosity um, from CJ, who is curious as to why they don't. Now, there are a few reasons we wrote down here, right? It could be that there is no money um, and that's why they can't afford a car. Um, maybe Nana doesn't have a license. Or, I mean, maybe Nana doesn't know how to drive. Makes sense, which is also very common. I wouldn't be um, surprised uh, if that were to, to be the case. Um, but what we do start to see here is that CJ starts to realize the social economic differences that exist and are present in a community, right? And so we'll write that here, these social economic differences that would put CJ in a place to, to need to ride the bus, but his friend Colby doesn't have to ride a bus, makes sense. And so we have here, um, CJ also um, doesn't know why they don't have a car. Now, sorry, I'm finishing writing here. So he doesn't know why they have a car. Um, and this presents him as a person who is very naive. Um, but at the same time, I think CJ is asking the right questions. Now, I want you to keep in mind that Kobe got into the car with his father and CJ is with his Nana. Right. So um, does CJ have parents? We're not entirely sure. Um, and so I'll put here CJ parents question mark. Does he have them? That could definitely be a reason as to why um, CJ and his Nana, you know, are not in the same situation as Kobe and his father because um, CJ is with his grandmother and not with his parents. Maybe his parents don't exist. Maybe he's being babysat by grandma. I mean, there's different things, different reasons, right? But um, again, we do start to see in this page that CJ starts to question, you know, why others have something that he doesn't have. Now, if we move on, we get to see the way that uh, Nana answers this question. And she basically says, I read, boy, what do we need a car for? We got a bus that breathes fire. And old Mr. Dennis, who always has a trick for you. The bus creaked to a stop in front of them. It sighed and sighed, and the doors swung 
open. And there you see on the side, Nana putting away the umbrella and CJ getting into the bus. Um, and you can see the bus right there um, called Five Market. And I would assume this is uh, Mr. Dennis. And I'll make note of that here. Okay, we have Mr. Dennis, um, who is also uh, smiling. Um, he seems like a cheerful, happy-go-lucky uh, bus driver, and we do know some things about him based on what Gra uh, what Nana responds. Um, she basically um, says that old Mr. Dennis always has a trick for you, specifically, right? They're talking about a magic um, trick, and we see that Mr. Dennis is uh, the bus driver. OK, um, now Nana, basically her what she does here is that she says that the bus breathes fire. OK, and so the bus being able to breathe in itself is an example of personification. Remember that personification is when you give human traits to something that is not human. The bus is not human, but um, Nana tells CJ that why do you need a car if you have a bus that breathes fire? Right. And giving this uh, trait of breathing to the bus is is what makes this personification. OK, now one thing that we can infer based on what Nana has said is that CJ and Nana uh, ride. The bus often. Uh, because. Mr. Dennis. Knows them and knows them enough that he continuously has a trick for uh, CJ every time he gets on the bus. So we can infer that they use the bus a lot. Um, now, I love the way that Nana does this. She basically tells CJ, like, it's not so much about not having something, but it's about you not needing it. And why don't you need it? Well, because you have a bus. So why do you need a car? And so that shift in focus again um, is 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 a good take from from Nana. And I'm going to go ahead and write it down here on a on a post it. And I'm going to name it just that. Nana's take and what she says is it's not. About. Uh, what you have or it's not about having something, but it's about uh, not needing something. Makes sense? You don't need um, necessarily, right? You don't, you don't, sorry. You don't need necessarily a, a car when you have a bus. Makes sense? What do you need the bus for? I'm sorry, the car for if you have a bus. And so she, doesn't actually answer his question. She doesn't actually say why they don't have a car, but she does basically remind him that they have access to a bus. And not only do they have access to a bus, um, but she kind of, um, you know, emphasizes the quality of this bus by saying it breathes fire, right? And so it's like a great bus to be on. It's exciting to be on this bus. And not just that, but you have the bus driver who always has a trick for you. So she doesn't tell him why they don't have a car, but she tells him, we don't need a car because these are the things that you have instead. Make sense? Um, and then you do see here at the bottom, right, that the bus creaked to a stop, and so that creak would be an example of auditory imagery. And we can see that it says here that the bus sighed and, sa and sagged and the door swung open. Um, now, this word choice here of the bus, uh, that the bus sighed is also an example of personification. Um, because a sigh is that um, it's that it's an emotion that we uh, display in the form of a sigh. Um, and so basically a sigh is like when you go like. <sighs> and so usually when people sigh, that means that they are tired, um, maybe they're overwhelmed. 
It means that, you know, maybe they're exhausted in some way, right? And that's why they sigh. And so, um, I, I mean, well, also sigh is an example of auditory imagery, by the way. So don't forget to write that. Um, but I do definitely uh, would see why the bus would feel still tired, overwhelmed, and exhausted um, because it's going up and down, right? It's going back and forth, picking up people. So I love the way that we get this element that even though um, you do have a bus instead of a car, um, I feel like the the act of the bus sighing and sagging still gives it that element of reality in the sense that, you know, these things are real. It is tiring. It is exhausting. And it is overwhelming to be riding on a bus. So I feel like this description, again, gives that that touch of reality that people experience when they ride a bus. It is not an easy commute to be on a bus. It is not um, something simple that people do. It is exhausting. And there is a sort of uh, tired emotion that, that kind of looms over the people that get on the bus because it goes a lot slower than a regular car. And, you know, there's a lot of the, the stopping and going, the stopping and going. And, you know, you're not necessarily going to... Sorry. You're not necessarily going to your route directly. You have to go through different routes until you finally get to yours. So again, we get that element of reality here um, and, and the reality that people that ride the bus experience and these emotions that are not necessarily explicitly stated, but are definitely acknowledged um, in this in this writing. And so when we move on to the next page, we see that um, CJ actually gets on the bus. And so as you can see here, turn the page. And I'll show you here. Um, so CJ actually gets on uh, on the bus and you can see here uh, Mr. Dennis is uh, showing him a coin. And so Nana's there in the back. They both she seems kind of happy and proud. Um, and the text says, what's that I see? Mr. Dennis asked. And so he pulled a coin from behind CJ's ear, placed it in his palm. Nana laughed her deep laugh and pushed CJ along. And so again, we go back to that magic trick that Nana was talking about that Mr. Dennis always does when he gets on the, on the bus. And then we also see that Nana laughs in her deep laugh. Now the laugh that she gives is an example of auditory imagery. But this deep laugh in particular is a good example of indirect characterization for Nana. Um, that deep laugh kind of characterizes her as a wise woman with a deep sense of knowledge um, and a woman who definitely seems to be optimistic about things. Um, and, and I'll add that other one, right? Deep in knowledge. And she doesn't necessarily have to be book smart, but just knowledge in the sense that she's able to um, educate um, CJ in the way that she has to. She doesn't scold him. She doesn't get after him, uh, but she does kind of direct him, right, um, to being the person that, that he should be and to think about life the way that he should be thinking about it, considering the questions that he's having. So um, when we move on to the next page, we see here that they are now inside the bus. Um, and so you get to see the different types of people that are in the bus, a diverse group of people. And I'll read what it says. It says, they sat right up front. The man across the way was tuning a guitar. An old woman with curlers had butterflies in a jar. Nana gave everyone a great big smile and a good afternoon. She made sure CJ did the same. So, sorry about the yawning, guys. Um, so as you can see here, right, we do have different characters. Um, we do have uh, this quirky uh, looking woman. Um, she looks like an elderly woman, right? We see a little bit of, of gray hair. Um, we do see that she is still wearing, well, we don't see it too much, but based on the text, we see that she's still wearing her curlers. 
Um, if we notice here, right, she's wearing, um, I don't know if they're socks or pantyhose or pants, uh, but we do see, right, that they are different colors. She's not necessarily matching. Um, we do see that um, she has here uh, butterflies in the jar, which could serve as a great uh, example of symbolism, uh, which we can talk more about once we get to the end. Um, we do have this bald man right here um, who is covered in tattoos. And we can see that um, he's on his phone. And then that same young lady that we had seen at the bus stop is also now at the same, uh, sorry, in the same bus, along with this same man that looks kind of like a businessman. And then we have this guy with the with the guitar, right? This musician. And then here we have uh, Mr. Dennis. And so we have CJ and we have Nana. Um, and as you can see, C CJ is doing what CJ does and he is observing. And I am not uh, surprised to see that he is staring at this Kirky woman next to him. Um, but one of the things that I do want to mention um, with this particular page, well, we see here, first of all, we see that what Nana does is go in and give everyone a big smile, right? So you have that gesture, right? That goes a long way, the gesture of a smile. And not just that, but she also takes it further and she provides an actual greeting, right? So what she demonstrates is that she is polite, um, she is respectful, and she acknowledges everyone that is on the bus. Not just that, but the text tells us here that she made sure, right, that CJ did the same thing, which what she is doing is setting the example you know, for, for CJ, right? Because she made sure that he did the same thing, that he smiled at everybody and that he offered a greeting to everyone. Didn't matter what they look like, didn't matter um, anything, right? Um, she made sure that everyone uh, received a smile and a greeting. And I think uh, that message in itself goes a long way, right? First and foremost, um, there is value in diversity. And there is um, nothing to fear when it comes to diversity. Um, if anything, you learn a lot by being around different types of people. Um, and not just there being value in diversity, but also everyone um, is worthy, right, in a sense of uh, respect. Everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, it doesn't matter what you're wearing, it doesn't matter if you match, if you're bald, if you are still wearing your curlers, if you're a regular young lady or a businessman or a, the bus driver, it doesn't matter who you are, right? Here you have this Nana's take that everyone is worthy of, of this respect, right? That Nana displays and, and, and shares with everybody on, on the bus. And so if we go to the next page, um, we get to see, all right, that uh, a closer, more focused, zoomed in look as to what is happening inside the, uh, the bus. And we see here that it says the bus lurched forward and stopped, lurched forward and stopped. Nana hummed as she knit. How come we always got to go here after church? CJ asked. Miguel and Kobe never have to go anywhere. Nana says, I feel sorry for those boys. They'll never get a chance to meet Bobo or the sunglass man. And I hear Trixie got herself a brand new hat. CJ stared at the window, feeling sorry for himself. He watched the car zip by on either side, watched a group of boys hop curbs on bikes. So we have a few things here, okay? So first and foremost, we have here an example of repetition because these two lines repeat. The bus lurched forward and stopped, lurched forward and stopped. Now this repetition mimics 
the movement of the bus. Specifically, the stopping and going, stopping and going, right? Because when it says here lurch, what they mean is basically an abrupt stop. So you got the stopping and going, stopping and going. So the bus lurched forward and stopped, lurched forward and stopped. Again, you got that mimicking of this movement. Now we have the word movement. So we already know that this is an example of what type of imagery? Kinesthetic, right? You can imagine the bus stopping, getting people on, getting people off, going, stopping again, getting people on, getting people off. And this entire time, Nana was not moved. She hummed. And I'm going to put here AI for auditory imagery. And she knit. Uh, but we have here Mr. Curious the Cat, who again demonstrates his curiosity through his questioning. And he asked, how come we always got to go here after church? Right. And so wherever they are going, we can make um, an inference that where they are going. It's not. The first time. OK, because he uses uh, these superlatives like the word always. Now, he may be a little bit dramatic. Maybe they don't always go there, but they do go there often, right? So much so that he begins to resent the routine, and he says that Miguel and Colby never have to go there, right? And so you can see here, uh, CJ begins to compare his daily routine to his friends, right? Miguel and Colby. And you can see, like, he's like, why? Why do I have to go here after church? But they don't, right? And so not only do you see that socioeconomic difference, but you also see that theme of service that um, you, and I don't, well, I guess it, it'll make more sense when you're done uh, reading the, the book, but there's another theme here, right, that um, is, is being noticed by, uh, CJ, who who begins to realize that you know, not only are there differences in the socioeconomic status, but there's also a difference in the things that my friends do and the things that I do. Makes sense. Um, now, I love, love, love the way that Nana adds value um, to the situation by basically um, saying that she feels bad. You know, she feels sorry for those boys because they'll never get the chance to meet these other types of people. Right. Um, she basically talks about uh, the boys, Miguel and Colby, missing out. On meeting. Uh, new. And interesting people. Right, she's like, they're never going to get a chance to meet them and, and, and see Trixie's new hat and I feel bad for them. But unfortunately, that doesn't really help CJ too much because you can see here it says CJ stared out the window uh, feeling sorry for himself. And here is where we start to see that example of internal conflict um, that CJ is dealing with, specifically um, that notion of man versus self, um, where he starts to, um, I guess, uh, long for a little bit more where he begins to um, feel bad for himself and the fact that he's not doing what other people are doing. And he continues to watch, right? An observant little boy. But what is he watching? He's watching the cars, which we can infer that, you know, he's longing for a car or at least for the answers as to why they don't get to ride a car. Maybe he's like, that's so unfair. Then he also sees, right, the group of boys and their bikes, and maybe he wishes he was on bike with friends, right, with the group of boys. Instead, he's like, why do we have to go here, right? And so, again, you start to see that internal conflict um, that he's uh, going through. And so... Again, Nana doesn't necessarily answer her his question like, why do they always have to go here? Um, and his friends don't. She doesn't answer that. What she does instead is that she adds value to being around other groups of people. 
and basically positions it as if you if you never do new things, if you never try new things, if you never put yourself out there, um, you're going to miss out on uh, other opportunities like meeting other people. Right. And so we get to see the way that Nana, again, she never directly answers the question, but instead she focuses on shifting right that focus from it's not why don't you do this it's what you're going to miss out on if you do it it's not about why don't i have this it's about why do you need it if you don't need it necessarily you don't need a car if you have a bus makes sense and so again we'll make note here in this post it right um that nana doesn't directly uh, respond to his questions. Um, instead, what she does is that she shows him basically the beauty that exists, and that doesn't fit uh, the rest, but the beauty that 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 exists in the things that he's it, at this moment, right? Um, maybe not being grateful for um, the things that he doesn't really find much value in. She wants him to see the beauty in being able to get on a bus and be exposed to different people, to see the beauty of being able to see a tree finally drink from a straw the water that it needs because it was so thirsty, right? The beauty that it is to be able to get on a bus that breathes fire and have a magic trick something that getting on a car doesn't give you, right? And so she tries to push him to see the beauty in the things that he, right, um, feels sorry for himself about, right? And so again, you start to see, um, you know, who a little bit more CJ is, what he is, the questions that he is asking, and you begin to see the way that Nana sets that example for him, the way she pushes him um, to, to be respectful to everyone, to think about his surroundings, think about nature, and think about the beautiful things um, that exist even in their reality. Make sense? And so I'm going to stop here. OK, and what we're going to do tomorrow when we meet again is we're going to be looking at uh, the next few pages. And in the next page, you see that now you have a blind man who goes on the bus and CJ, right, give, you know, he, he does what CJ does and he does uh, ask like, Nana, how come he can't see? And I love the way Nana responds to him. She says, boy, what do you know about seeing? Some people watch the world with their ears. And I love that so much because um, she is definitely uh, speaking in metaphor and trying to uh, allow CJ to understand. And he may not understand, but wants him to see that, you know, it's not about what you can see with your eyes. It's what you can hear with your ears. And we'll talk more about uh, what that means tomorrow. And uh, we'll finish the rest of the pages then. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of your day and I'll see you mañana. Bye bye.